the the most important thing that I've learned is there's absolutely never any reason to panic or freak out. Uh, you just stay calm and stay focused. And, uh, you know, what you uh, perceive as something that's like devastating at the moment, like years down the road, you might realize, man, that's the best thing that could have happened. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Guru Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Rich Willie. Rich, well, he speaks from experience. A veteran sideman and prolific composer, Rich has played with the likes of Maynard Ferguson, Mel Torme, and Tommy Dorsey, and has published a massive collection of arrangements, compositions, and method books. But success on the bandstand came at a price. Rich has had to endure a number of setbacks that nearly ended his career, eventually leading Rich to become a student of Donald Reinhardt's pivot system and to his commitment to provide help and hope to others. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. Welcome to this a new episode of the Trumpet Guru Saying, and I am joined by Mr. Rich Willie. Rich, it is a pleasure to get to hang with you today, my friend. How's life uh, treating you? Everything's good. I have zero complaints, so I only have things to be grateful for. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That is absolute truth. Um, so, Rich, uh, besides being a uh, trumpet player, a valve trombonist, uh, bass trumpet player, tuba player now, uh, also a composer and arranger and engineer and uh, so talented uh, and uh, also is, is a, a highly respected teacher of uh, the uh, teachings of Doc Reinhardt. Uh, and so actually uh, we had met previously, but um, you know, the, the person who kind of instigated this was was our mutual friend, Mark Mike Barkley. Mike is uh, one of the show's sponsors, and uh, he's one of your former students. So um, you can tell me all the dirt about him later. Uh, well, he, he plays well in spite of studying with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he, he holds you in the highest regards. Yeah, that's really so, fine. Uh, so anyway... Uh, you know, when we were we were having the the pre-show, just kind of talking and, and catching up with each other, uh, sort of thing. You you were you hit on on a lot of really interesting topics, and I think one of the things that I would actually kind of like to start maybe more in the middle of your career than the beginning of your career, uh, just to kind of set the stage for people who who don't know you. Um, you know, you were you were mentioning that you've gone through some some chop issues and, and some things like that and, and have had to reinvent yourself a few times. Um, you know, wh when you've gone through those processes, uh, what are some of the, the big takeaways that you've gotten from having to deal with, with issues and like and specifically, how has it helped you become a, a better teacher? Huh? <clears throat> well, let me ponder this for a second because <laughs> uh you know some days uh some days you have all these revelations other days you realize wow man I'm, I'm you know i don't know anything uh so i think what could have been the most traumatizing thing that happened to me was when i had bell's palsy and uh doc had told me about doc reinhardt had told me about bell's palsy in probably 1982 or 83, I can't remember when it was, but he talked about a student who had Bell's palsy. So when it came on, I was actually on a, a tour and uh, I had one more night to play. And uh, and I ended up, you know, going to the hospital. I, I couldn't even, there's no way the, the right side was gone. But uh, I knew that it was Bell's palsy. Uh, they gave me uh, a steroid, I think prednisone, and they gave me acyclovir, a, uh, uh, you know what that is. Oh man, Andy, what is it? Uh, uh, what is it you take when you have like, uh, I can't, <laughs> I can't remember this word. Or anticoagulant uh, or no, no, no. Uh, antimatter. <laughs> Anti M. I don't know. Anyway, 
Hey, Slack Levere. It, it'll come to me later, probably right when we turn this thing off. And then when I came back uh, to Asheville, I went to the VA hospital, you know, Army veteran. And uh, and she uh, she affirmed that, yeah, that's, that's exactly what the guy should have given me. And uh, so fortunately, I mean, within 24 hours, I, I sought medical attention. And uh, it was like January 26th or something. And uh, I had, the, I had, I was supposed to play with Natalie Cole on February 21st. And man, you talk about, uh, I, I, like I said, I could have freaked out, but uh, I figured, you know what, let's just, you know, let this play out, see what happens. And I didn't try to buzz my lips. Uh, I didn't try to play because I knew that everything was useless. Uh, but just staying calm and knowing that, you know, like, what's the old saying? This too shall pass. I, I just knew that uh, getting all freaked out is, is not going to, it's not going to help anything. I mean, the same thing is going to happen whether I freak out or not. So I just, uh, I was working on a book at the time and I just focused on that. And I remember one night my wife says, I can't believe you're not freaking out about this. You know, you can't play, you know, all your life you've wanted to play, you know, trumpet, whatever. And uh, you're not freaking out. I said, what, what good would it do to freak out? So I think that's really the most important thing is if I have issues to just stay calm because, uh, you know, getting all like anxiety stricken uh, is not going to help. And uh, it was, oh, when did I, that was 2009. I know in, uh, uh, I, I turned out a book called Focal Point about a year after I turned out uh, uh, the Reinhardt routines, which was Chris LaBarbera's suggestion, by the way, I, I try to give credit to everybody who's helped because, you know, I don't want anybody to think that I'm, I'm this genius because I'm really not. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, in that book, I quoted this, uh, there's a writer, like an inspirational writer, Og Mandino, and he had this story called the 12th angel. And, uh, this one little guy, he had this mantra, which was day by day in every way I'm getting better or something like that. And uh, I just, you know, I, I used to, to make a rhyme out of it, you know, every day in every way I'm getting better and better and better. And uh, when uh, the, the whole concept of positive affirmations, it's like the self-talk. You've heard of, about the self-talk. If, if I'm practicing and struggling and kicking the garbage cans and, you know, cursing and saying, you know, I, you know, suck and all this, man, that's, that's so counterproductive. So I finally learned that it's, you know, my self-talk reinforces, you know, the positive thing, like, you know, I am getting better, even though I'm going through this hard time, I know I'm getting better, you know, because uh, there's lessons that I'm learning, you know, what, what they say, uh, uh, an, uh, you don't become an expert sailor by always sailing on smooth seas, right? Exactly. You know, you, you got to have those rough seas to become a, an expert sailor. So I think, the, the most important thing that I've learned is there's absolutely never any reason to panic or freak out. Uh, you just stay calm and stay focused. And, uh, you know, what you uh, perceive as something that's like devastating at the moment, if years down the road, you might realize, man, that's the best thing that could have happened. You know, today I'm, I'm grateful that I had Bell's palsy because, uh, you know, guys who have it, if they come to me, I can help reassure, you know, don't even try to play, man. You know, until you can whistle your lips, don't even, you know, whistle, form your lips to whistle. Don't even think about putting a mouthpiece to your face because all you're going to do is train those muscles that have not uh, sufficient strength to, to come back and, and do anything yet. You're going to train them to do something that's compensating for the fact that they have no strength. So don't do anything, man. Just, you know, relax. Go do something else, man. Go bowling. You know, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've had, uh, I've had to recover from a few uh, surgeries that, uh, you know, ran into some, some complications or abdominal surgeries. And that's one of the things, you know, I'd be on a, on a form or something and someone would say, oh, I'm getting a hernia surgery. You know, how, how soon can I start playing? My doctor says this or, you know, somebody, and I, I will chime in and say, look, I'm not a doctor, but I have experienced, you know, six abdominal surgeries over the the course of the past 10 years wow. Here's what i can tell you my experiences are when you feel like you're ready to play don't don't <laughs> <Give Yeah. it. laughs> these are the things that you want to do these are the things you want to be careful about and it's it's speaking from experience and what i found is that um you know, like you're, I, I'm, I'm huge into the the motivational space you know and 
uh, you know, I, I like one of the quotes Tony Robbins uses, which, you know, you know, life either happens to you or for you. And I like the idea of learning those lessons and saying, okay, well, here I'm at this point where I can't play. When I come back, what can I do to make my playing better? Yeah, you know, how can I use right. this time more efficiently? And sometimes it's, you know, just getting away from the horn completely. I mean, I'm not even thinking about it, but sometimes it's, it's thinking about retooling, you know, how do you want to approach things? How do you want to do things a little bit differently? Taking time to, to uh, search out the resources that you need to, to learn uh, a, a more efficient approach. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, we, I think we all at some point in our careers, uh, whether you're a professional player, or amateur player, or whatever you're doing, you're going to run into a point where you don't know what to do next. And that's where it's so important to to find people who have uh, have gone on before you and have made the mistakes and had the had the the negative experiences, but have learned from them and they can share with you a, a better way of, of approaching it. Right. No, absolutely. And that, that thing about whatever the doctor says, man, I would double it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, well, I, I told you I didn't want to go into it, but uh, a doctor told me to wait six weeks after a uh, an oral surgery before I started playing again. I waited six weeks to the day, and I came back gangbusters. And that's, you know, basically what caused this uh, original lip problem that I had in 1980 or 81, whenever that was. So, yeah. Uh, and trumpet, man, you cannot cram on trumpet. You know, you cannot cram for a gig. You have to spend hours every day or else you're not going to be able to play a gig that lasts hours. And if, if you try to like, I, I, there, there are, you know, there's exceptions. There's guys who don't practice and I hate them all. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I practice every day. And, you know, nowadays I practice tuba, uh, bass trumpet and trumpet. And I'm also uh, learning how to play the EV, the electronic valve instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, you know, I practice uh, all of those every day. And uh, try to, you know, I, well, tr simulating a gig in the, the practice room, I think that's like the, the hardest thing. If you're not playing a lot of gigs and you have demanding gigs coming up, to me, that's the hardest thing because my chops, I always have to be ready, you know, for whatever comes up, I got to be ready for it. I can't like at the last minute think, oh, okay, I can spend two days cramming. No, you can't do it. on. I can't do it on trumpet. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like in sports, you know, they talk about like being game ready. You know, where, where you get these guys that, that are, you know, if you think about being a, a trumpet player, like being an athlete, and some people say it's a, it's a valid analogy. Some people, It really is. It, it isn't. <laughs> but regardless, uh, to perform at a high level, you, you have to have a level of practice in. And there's a difference between practice, practice and game like really game level practice and you know there have been so many top level players both in you know basketball football whatever uh you know it's like they're going through rehab and they're they're doing the basic training or they're coming out of retirement and they're still in great shape physically but they're you know they say they're not game ready because there's there's something that's a little bit different than you know when you're when you're on stage when you have to be on uh so Absolutely. I I'm, I'm with you hundred percent, you know, but I have to admit, I am one of those people who, who doesn't practice. Uh, unfortunately, I, I sound like I haven't practiced. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just reminded myself, I, uh, I opened up the, the bottled water and I immediately threw the cap in the trash to me that that's because I made a commitment. I'm going to drink this whole bottle of water and, uh, you know, playing the trumpet is the same thing, man. You have to make a commitment. You can't say, ah, you know, you really can't. If, if you don't make a commitment to it, it'll eat you alive. It, it, that's been my experience anyway. Yeah. Again, and, and, there's all these exceptions who, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't and, hate them, but yeah, let's just yeah. say I envy them. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, it's an interesting uh, thing too. I mean, it's, it's go, you know, having that, that go for it mentality. You know, you, I don't feel like you can be uh, exceptionally successful and whatever your definition of success is, uh, by playing it safe, you know, and uh, especially in the world of, of, uh, trumpet players. I mean, it, it, maybe you can play a little safe if you're, if you're playing, you know, the second or third book somewhere, but if you're going to be a principal player in an orchestra, you're going to be a lead trumpet player, uh, in, in a, a commercial setting, uh, you can't be tentative. 
I mean, you, you've got to you've got to be willing to just go out there, and and sometimes that means being willing to crash and burn. Um, but uh, I, I think, and, and I think that the greatest players, they have that sort of uh, reckless abandon to them, where you you know that they're they're constantly pushing themselves to the limits of their abilities. Um, and that's how they grow, and that's that's how they create this this wonderful magical uh, experience for us as a listener. So uh, yeah, don't don't be afraid to make mistakes. Is I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah, man, you got to be willing to suck, especially as a an improvising jazz musician. You know, all all my students who come to me wanting to learn how to improvise, I say, hey, man, the first thing you have to do is you got to know that you are gonna suck, and you can't be afraid of it. Uh, but you know, kind of harking back to what you were just talking about. I've read about uh, Louis Armstrong, you know, like in his early days, he would be playing in this place and, you know, there'd be six people there and uh, it'd be raining outside and, and they'd have pans catching the water dripping all over the place. And, you know, it's just the most dismal place on earth. And he would be going for it, you know, 100%, man. He wouldn't leave anything on the field. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you're always playing it safe on a gig, I, I don't know, man. I think you might uh, be playing it safe in life and you may not get everything out of it that you're going to, you know, that you possibly could get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very true. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, as I want to transition into the, to some of the, the Reinhardt stuff, uh, I, I think it's really interesting. And, in, and to me, uh, Doc's teachings, resonated with me because I have uh, that scientific kind of mind, you know, uh, that I like to analyze things, I like to break things down, I like to try and figure out why they work, how they work. And, you know, sometimes that's to my dis my dismay because I, I can I can get down some rabbit holes real quick. But um, what I like, one of the things I like about uh, about the Reinhardt approach is that it says that there are some fundamental ways that things work and those are consistent uh, it just in general. Uh, and then, but then there are these specific subcategories of those things uh, that allow you to uh, predict with a certain level of accuracy, the most probable outcome and the most probable, most probable advantages and disadvantages of any given situation. Uh, so it, it allows for the freedom of individual and individual uh, physiology and, and psychology. So, uh, and I think that from a, a, a problem solving perspective, I think that it is by far the most thorough method of approaching brass playing that there is uh, to date. I'm not saying that, that somebody can't come up with something a little more refined, but you know, the, but to date, I think that it is uh, probably the most the the, the the most thorough in terms of an analytical and diagnostic approach to to playing. Um, so, from from your perspective as a student, because you studied directly with Doc, uh, so you know what what was like kind of the vibe that you got from him in terms of. Uh, his ability to balance the analytical side of playing and the musical side of playing, because those, the, while they're they're necessary and related, sometimes I think people get get too focused on on uh, you know dissecting and not not enough on on making the music. Okay, feel free to steer me back to those two points that you just made. Okay. But, uh, so when I first got to him, it was June of 1978, and I think he told me he was 72 at the time. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't have his uh, biography in front of me, but, you know, he was a curmudgeon, man. He was a, you know, a cantankerous kind of a grouchy dude, man. And mm -hmm. he would slam his hand on the desk and say, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about that. You know, a lot of people would, they'd probably never go back, but, uh, you know, that's kind of, I needed to be shaken up because I guess uh, in 78, I was 23, 22, 23. And, uh, uh, and I was falling apart. My, my face was, you know, I'd gotten by on a certain amount of ability and, uh, and things were kind of falling apart. And he said, yeah, things that work for you when you're young, uh, don't always carry over into your old age. As you get older, your reflexes slow down. So we're younger, we're stronger. We have faster reflexes. We can recover faster, et cetera, et cetera. And as we get older, uh, things start to crumble. 
And you hear all these guys like at ITG, which I'm going to next week. You hear these guys, oh man, when I was a teenager, good grief, man, I could play double high C all night and all that. And I can't even, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay. So doc, uh, okay. First of all, he, he categorized the types of players. There are distinct types. No two people play exactly like he used to say, I never give a lesson that I don't take a lesson. I heard him say that so many times, but, uh, and, you know, since I've been working with Doug, I kind of understand uh, the type one is people with perfectly even teeth. When they have no malocclusion. Their teeth are perfect. And uh, so they're either going to play upstream or downstream. And it doesn't necessarily depend on the angle of the horn. It depends on how much uh, top lip or how much bottom lip predominates into the mouthpiece. And then the type two, and, uh, you know, Doug says these are kind of like theoretical types. They almost don't exist. Type two is a guy that walks around like this. That's me. Okay. okay. But most type twos are, are typed uh, guys who have uh, the lantern jaw, as, as Reinhardt call it, kind of the bulldog jaw. Uh, they play either as a, a 3B or a 3A or a type 4 or a type 4A. You know, they play as one of these other types. So 3 is the basic downstream type. 4 is the basic upstream type. Uh, and then, you know, in 3B, you have... Uh, Okay, so you had pivot classification one, which is push everything kind of goes up to a higher point on your teeth and gums. Uh, and he's talking about the mouthpiece and the lips as one unit. He said that a thousand times. Go to a higher point on your teeth and gums to ascend and to a lower point to descend. And then the pivot classification two is just the opposite. Now, I, did, I took a course in technical writing at North Texas, which was one of the best courses I ever had. Because, man, I never had to think so hard in any course ever. And, uh, you know, Reinhardt kind of prided himself for his technical writing. And uh, I'm sure there's technical writers out there who would give him varying uh, degrees or, you know, very uh, varying their grading of his uh, ability to, you know, to, to, to say it so well that it, it can't be misinterpreted. Man, I think Reinhardt stuff is easy to misinterpret. And I think a lot of people do. And a lot of people also think that, you know, it's so complicated. Well, what he was trying to do was make sure that he didn't steer anybody wrong. And sometimes that takes a lot of words to, to you know, cover your ass, basically, so you don't get misinterpreted. Well, it's kind of like the guys who say, well, you know, I don't, I don't use Finale. I use Sibelius or I use Muse Score because it's so much easier. Well, if you use Finale, which I do, there's nothing, it's, it's like the industry standard because, you know, there, you can do this much stuff in Finale. And uh, I've never found anything that I couldn't do in Finale. The other ones are easier, but, you know, and they always compare it to Finale. Well, you know what? It's like, it's like comparing a Volkswagen to a Cadillac, you know? Why don't you just drive a Cadillac or, you know, stop saying my Volkswagen is kind of like a Cadillac. So uh, a lot of guys are turned off by Reinhardt's approach because they say, oh, analysis paralysis. Well, and then they end up being the young guy who could play, you know, you know, ridiculously. And then as he got older, he started falling apart and refused to read the, you know, read the finale uh, handbook. You know what I mean? To, yeah. to really dig in depth. So, and then we get back to the whole point of music, man, Reinhardt, he said it a million times. Uh, when you get on the bandstand, forget about Reinhardt, man. You just think about playing the music and he would give you stuff. Uh, he would cover everything. I mean, he did clef, you know, transposition by clef. He didn't want you uh, to not know how to train. Like if you got a part on a gig, he wanted, no matter what it was, he wanted you to be able to play it. And he gave you stuff to drill you on that. Uh, as far as music, man, he was, he was a brilliant musician. Have you ever heard? I think I posted his bluebells of Scotland on the trumpet Herald. I don't know. Did you hear that, man? I mean, he was, dastardly bad man badass man he was unbelievable so you know for him it was take care of all this stuff in the practice room so that when you get on the gig you can forget about it and just play kind of like charlie parker said learn everything you can and when you get on the gig forget about it and just play that's exactly what reinhardt did and he gave you stuff oh man if you did his routines you would be cursing and you know it's hard and, and and then you get on the gig and it's like oh it's easy to play, man, because <laughs> he gave you stuff that was so hard in the practice room that, uh, you know, when it's time to just simply play music, it was like, bada bing, man, this is easy. So uh, I hope I answered your question, man. 
So it's kind of like front loading. You know, you, you, you do the heavy lifting up front and then, you know, by the time you, you get to the gig, it's like, oh man, this is a walk in the park. Or uh, I've heard it called the medicine ball approach. I, uh, I had this guy at North Texas, uh, Dr. Bill Gardner for theory. And every Friday we had the departmentals. So, you know, a lot of the teachers taught to the test, right? And uh, Bill Gardner, man, he, he, he went fast and he gave you so much that by Friday it was like, man, that was so easy. You know, nobody struggled with their departmentals with uh, Bill Gardner. And uh, anybody who studied with him, hopefully they can affirm what I'm saying, that that's the way, man. And that's what Reinhardt was. He was a medicine ball approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, that there's there's definitely something to be said for that. And, you know, so uh, I think that, that um, I mean, I'm one of those people that when I when I first got turned on to the Reinhardt, Reinhardt method, I, like, bought a book. You know, I, I bought the Encyclopedia of the Pivot System. It was, you know, I don't know, maybe late 80s early 90s something like that um but i didn't understand it you know uh i interpreted it and i didn't uh, apparently did not interpret it correctly uh so like you're saying you know the, the importance of the clarity uh but i think ultimately we can only describe things based upon our own perspectives and and when you when you say something uh when, when you classify something as being a specific thing then uh it, it sometimes uh, gets interpreted by other people as something slightly different uh, because, you know, like if you, if one person says uh, like squeeze and another person says compression and another person says engagement, uh, they, they may be all talking about the same action. But Somebody else might interpret that as pinch. Yeah. Right. And pinching yeah. power and compression. I know they can be misinterpreted. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, that, that's why I, I really uh, find it fascinating to talk with, with people who not only have studied the method, uh, but, you know, that the people actually had, had studied with Doc and especially those who have taken those teachings and, and maybe, you know, added some other things, other aspects and, and tried to, you know, create, um, create their own vibe for, you know, you know figuring out ways that, that it works best for them. Um, and yeah, I know, I know like the, the people that have said, okay, like Doug says, okay, well, there really is no two, you know, you're basically, you're, you're, you're a three or a four, uh, even though that is a, a technical classification, the reality is that it's, you know, it's, it, you're generally one of these two types. So, um, you know, helping to kind of clarify, uh, the teachings. So, um, like for me, uh, I, I don't want to get a, a lesson on this, uh, on the air, maybe I'll, I'll talk to you about this later on, but, but being someone who does fall into that category, uh, the technically being a, a two being, you know, having a, a protruding lower jaw, uh, you know, what mm -hmm. I found is that most teachers that I had earlier in my career had no idea how to deal with my specific physiology. You know, it was a whole lot of, well, you're having, this problem, which now, as I understand the, the, the method and the, the uh, teachings and like, okay, well, what are the, what are the weak spots in the, the playing of a, of a four? Uh, and, you know, those were all the problems that I was having. And uh, instead of being able to say, okay, this is how we correct this through uh, a, a, the these studies, it was okay. Well, change your aperture. You know, you you should be yep, yep. higher on your on your chops, and you should be doing this, and you should do that. And it had it were they were completely opposite of what my body wanted to do. And what and what Doug had told me was that all the problems that I, I started to develop later in my life as a player were because my body wanted to do one thing naturally because of my my physiology or needed right. thing, but my mind. <clears throat> Telling me to do something else because that's what my teachers told me to do. Right. Um, so with with the ideas of uh, we have to kind of find the the correct path for us. What are some of the diagnostic tools that you utilize and that you suggest people uh, you know, consider when they're dealing with with kind of you know these standard playing issues that we have? Okay. Before I do that. You brought up three things that I wanted to talk about real quick. Uh, first thing is, so many teachers, they teach guys to play the way they think they play. Uh, and 
Doc used to talk about, you know, these guys <clears throat> at universities who never turned out a bad student. And it's because they never got a bad student. I remember when I went to North Texas, John Haney was like the big deal. Well, you know what? You didn't get to study with John Haney until you were a graduate student and one of like the chosen few. So he never got a bad student. And I, I know that happens in many schools and I'm not going to badmouth anybody, but uh, that's just the fact. Uh, so I said, you said, there were three things you said. Uh, one was to teach the way they want to teach. Uh, well, you know, another one was uh, Doc told me that he wanted to include a type five embouchure because he said a lot of African-American guys, he called them black, the, the black gentlemen. <laughs> he said, uh, a lot of them, everything that I have in this book for them is upside down. He said, uh, old man, Charles Colon wouldn't let him do it. He said that that would be racist. And he said, how is that racist? He said, there, there are certain things that uh, the way black people play is just different. And he, he couldn't explain it. You know, God made him that way. You know, why, why, uh, why call him a racist for pointing out something that he discovered by, you know, years of experimentation and research. So uh, the type five embouchure, which Chris LaBarber might know something about, that guy's got a memory for the stuff that Doc taught. And uh, you said, you were talking about, oh, there was another thing I wanted to say that was really important. Uh, you know, I forgot to mention earlier, the straight type three, there's this, the straight type three, which they usually have a very downward uh, angle, almost like a clarinet player, their angle is, and Co Gazzo, Conrad Gazzo was a type three. Uh, I can't remember the third thing, dog on it. All right, so you're, the, the question you're asking was about diagnostic? Yeah. Something so, about diagnostics? Yeah, so, so for people who, who are, you know, experiencing, uh, you know, general issues with their playing, you know, uh, let's, so, let's, so let's, let's, make, let's maybe make this a, a, a more specific scenario. Okay. Um, so uh, let's say that, uh, you know, you're this, and this is one of the, probably the, the, the most common questions, you know, you're having trouble with your upper register. Um, when, when you're diagnosed, when you're kind of analyzing someone, or, you know, even if you're just kind of talking, talking to someone or through uh, through a process um do you ever start talking about uh the 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 track uh f at the beginning kind of like setting the stage or is it just more of a well let me you know tell me what you think your problem is and 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 show me what you do and then we figure it out from there so is it kind of like planting the seed of of what we're looking to to, to try and find or is it just don't think about it, just play and then let me look at it and kind of figure out what what could be going on in, in terms of your playing. Well, I've had, I don't know, four or five, maybe six students who have come to me <clears throat> who were just like in trouble and in trouble forever. And uh, I have, uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't figure them out, you know, I couldn't figure it out. And uh, I sent one guy to Scott Holbert. I know I sent uh, some guys to uh, Doug. You know, I'm sending everybody to Doug now because Doug, he's got the eye. He really does. Uh, now I can see things in other people. I, I couldn't fix. I couldn't figure out on my my own that I was uh, what a, a Doc called that multiple embouchures because I was trying to play one instrument as a three B and the other one as a three A. Uh, tuba is a 3A and bass trumpet and trumpet is a 3B. So that's multiple embouchures. But uh, I try to figure out what they can do and what they can do well. And, uh, you know, early on, you can tilt the horn uh, while while they're playing and you can see if if it's like easier to ascend when they do, do you know, tilt this way or if it's easier to ascend when they tilt this way, then they're, uh, they're you need to direct them into being... Uh, it kind of adhering to all the the mannerisms uh, that are characteristic of the type that apparently they are. Now, uh, I think it might have been Scott Holbert was saying that he wished that Doc had never used the term three B for now, because that's what he typed me as a three B for now. <clears throat> it means like, okay, what 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 does that mean? I'm eventually going to become. And I used to think that meant that you you would turn into a type four or something, but. Uh, Everybody, everybody who plays an instrument 
is capable, or I should say a brass instrument, is capable of playing successfully if they figure out what they need to do to propel them as the type of player they are and what they need to avoid that will hold them back is from what kind of player they are. <clears throat> Reinhardt used to say, if you don't possess, uh, like on trumpet, the, the fourth line G above the staff all the time, you know, as well as like all the way down to F sharp, if you don't have that all the time, then your chops are merely developing. They're still developing. So <laughs> my chops, once again, are developing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and these guys who uh, they never had to work at it, man, they don't need to think about it. You know, guys who are, you know, 60 years old now and they're still playing great, man, I would not, I would not encourage them to do anything different. They just need to do what they're doing. Guys who have been struggling all their lives and have been getting worse, chances are they're doing something contrary to their physical makeup, to their physical type. Or what are you, you're saying, the physiology. Uh, yeah, you know, we all have, the, and Doc used to talk about the guys who would smile and you could see their gums. You know, when I smile, you barely see my teeth. So I have a long upper lip. Guys who have a short upper lip, and I, I have a, a daughter who, when she smiles, you know, you see her gums. So she would be a type four probably, is it? that's what Doc used to say. Uh, you know, people have different thicknesses of lips. Uh, you know, your teeth are different. You know, finding the place where you have the four legs of the inner embouchure. You know, some people have to play over here. Some people play over here. Uh, almost nobody plays dead center. <clears throat> and then, you know, placing higher, placing lower. There's so many factors. So uh, you have to really uh, size up a lot of things. And as as Doug has proven to me, you know, you, it's probably better to over-experiment than under-experiment. Like if you think you find something right away and, well, like if you're a 60-year-old guy and you've been playing great all your life, yeah, you found it and you may have stay there. But if you never find it, you know, you might need to experiment a little more. Yeah. So does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, if, if if it if it ain't broke don't fix it sure. sort of thing and uh you know but but if it isn't working the way you want it to then be willing to you know to right consider. right yeah. keep and an I, open mind and that you know and that is i think the key that uh we want to say that we have an open mind but um uh, you know it's it's still we have in we have in our mind what we are willing to accept at any given point in time, and and if somebody suggests something that's outside of your range of your 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 comfort your comfort zone, then you don't want to try it, uh, you know. But the way I look at it is like you know if if I'm not getting the results I want, that means that I probably don't know what I need to do. So you know. If it's something I, I would have thought of already, that I would have been doing it. So, you know, be willing to to, to listen to the advice of, of someone that you trust and uh, and at least give it a shot, you know, because uh, it's not going to, it's not probably not going to hurt in the long run if that person is competent and capable and that, that they have a, a an approach that works. So, you know, Bobby Shu said something along those lines. He said, you actually are your best teacher because you're the one who permits things to enter or you're the one who repels things. So, you know, <laughs> that d discernment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. sometimes, I mean, on tuba, I, I took some lessons with some people. It's like, I wanted to find a Reinhardt tuba uh, teacher and I couldn't, uh, I mean, Doug is the closest thing, but uh yeah, I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the things these guys are saying. And it's like, man, if I know if I did that, I would be in bigger trouble. So, you know, I, I know enough uh, <laughs> largely from uh, hard-earned experience uh, to, to filter out the, you know, the, the harmful stuff. So yeah. most of the time, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, that, that does uh, kind of get you back to, uh, I guess, what I was trying to ask earlier. Like from what I was trying to get to earlier, I guess was uh, that these tools obviously are super helpful uh, for diagnosing problems in your students. Uh, do you utilize them for yourself in terms of a self-diagnostic tool? Like when you're running into to trouble, I mean, obviously you, you've already you know, mentioned several times Doug Elliott, uh, you know, a very very talented trombonist and and mouthpiece manufacturer and 
uh, and teacher of uh, the, the Reinhardt system. Um, but do you, like, if you're having trouble on, on a gig uh, or, or you're practicing and you're, you're having some specific trouble, are you intentionally going back to some of these teachings? And uh, Absolutely. I remember one day uh, Doc told me, he said, he said, if you break down brass playing, he said, it's, it's a few things. He said, and if you can cover all those things every day and keep them all alive, he said, play something high, something low, something loud, something soft, something tongue, something slurred, some sustained stuff, some compression work, uh, some multiple tonguing. So what was that? Nine things. If, if you can cover all those things every day. And, uh, and then he said, you try to balance, uh, what your gig doesn't give you in those aspects you try to balance that in the practice room and you every day you try to get a balance of all those ingredients now compression you only need to do a little uh multiple tonguing you know i i keep it alive i rarely use it uh and then compression you know compression on bass trumpet used to be just so easy for me and it was never easy on trumpet and uh just recently i've, I've actually been uh getting having a little more success with compression on trumpet so i think part of that was uh and i don't know that doc misdiagnosed me as a 3b i think at the time that was really working well for me uh i just think that you know playing tuba jarred my chops into you know like i was i thought i was pulling down to us us end but what i was doing was i was looking down which is pushing up so yeah uh i, I don't always <laughs> I, obviously i don't always diagnose myself well but uh yeah so basically what you were saying uh am i able to to find the things that i need to do from time to time like there was a time i was playing a lot of lead trumpet and uh and i'm on this gig and it's just you know the first set wasn't going right so i went into the back of the it was a restaurant i went way into the back uh where hopefully nobody could hear me and i did like a couple lines of doc's track routine Cause I just, I could tell, man, I was, I was, uh, uh, so the track routine, I guess it's to, uh, uh, I don't have the definition in front of me, but, uh, you know, it works out the track of the inner embouchure so that you're, you know, you're going the right way to, to ascend and going the right way to descend or whatever. And, uh, I could just tell, man, that, that it, it was off. And, uh, so I, I went back and I did that and I came out and the next set felt great. So every once in a while, I'm able to to understand right then what I need to do. Sometimes it it doesn't uh, occur to me right away. Sometimes it takes a day or two or a year or two. <laughs> uh, all all in its its own time. I but I, I I think that that's the, the two components there that I see are that your studies have allowed you to uh, identify uh, when something is wrong. Um, and then to give you some very specific tools to apply to those diagnoses. So, and I think sometimes we, you know, the problem is it, it's one or, or both uh, that, that we, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm, I can't play today, you know, well, what specifically is going on? You know, so you, you're not able to diagnose that, that, hey, my, my, I feel like my track is off. You know, if it, this, this is what's going on, uh, and then maybe they can identify what's going on, but then they don't have the, the, t the accurate tools to recalibrate themselves. So, uh, I think that's one of the things that, that always, that's always fascinating to me about, uh, the Reinhardt method is that it provides you both the, the clinical diagnosis, if you will, and then also the, the, the interventions to, to correct those those problems so yeah a couple times now you've called it the reinhardt method i i more i think of it more as you know reinhardt's approach i don't i don't call it a method because like he told me he said you know uh i don't give a lesson that i don't take a lesson he said uh every every student uh is is his own system basically mm -hmm. so you you can't you can't have hard and fast for every single person or even like you know all three a's you can't treat them all the same either because some of them, you know, might, might do, uh, things that are holding them back or, uh, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that was making sense. No, uh, no, it, it makes absolute sense. And yeah, you know, that 
for me, one of the, and this is one of the reasons I, I certainly did want to have uh, someone who, who had studied with Doc uh, to talk a little bit more in depth about some of these concepts, um, that with any teacher, it's very easy to become beholden to, uh, you know, what you were taught uh, and your interpretation of what was taught, and then those become hard and fast rules. And I've seen it occur in, in the trumpet world. I've seen it occur in the martial arts world. I've seen it occur in, in pretty much everything in life, uh, that there are those who will take information. Uh, they'll, they'll create an idea or an approach to things. Um, and with the spirit of this is uh, developing a deeper understanding, and then I want to present this to you, and then hoping that you will then take it and, and interpret it and, and make it make it your own. But then there, there are those people that want to hold on to that and become super dogmatic about it. And that any variation, uh, even the slightest variation from what they were told or what they think they were told, uh, then becomes you know, a point of contention. Blasphemy, so, right. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, with, with, the, with the teachings of Doc, uh, I mean, how long, did you, how long did you study with Doc directly? Okay, so I took several lessons between 78 and I moved to Philadelphia in the summer of 81. And uh, I ended up living like right on the next block. He was at 1720 Chestnut. I lived at 1813 Ranstead Street for about a year, and that was, I'm serious, not even a block away from him. Uh, it was between Chestnut and Market, uh, r right off of 18th Street. So he was between 17th and 18th on Chestnut, so it was like one block over. But, uh, and and I, uh, I also, I had to get a day gig to uh, support myself. Uh, uh, next thing you know, I had a family, and uh, so I, I, I got, I, I used my GI Bill to go to school in Philadelphia uh, as a printing school. <laughs> it's no longer in business. I wonder why. But uh, I got a, a job working in a like an ad shop doing paste up and mechanicals. And they had a typesetting machine that wasn't being used all the time. So the guy said, said, go over and learn how to use that machine. I said, I don't even know how to type. He said, if you can type one word a minute, he said, and, and spell it right. He said, we can use it. I said, whoa, can put the bar pretty low. Yeah. So uh, I started doing that. So uh, next thing you know, I'm learning how to do typesetting by typing stuff for Doc. He had all these hand, you know, I thought I had my book here. It's it's in the shelf in the next room here. Uh, he had all these handouts, which were multiple pages. And uh, I could take, you know, and he, his printing bills were phenomenal, man. He had to spend a lot of money on printing. But I would typeset his things, you know, I could take, you know, three pages and make it into one page, nice and legible. And he loved that, man. So next thing you know, he's giving me free lessons. He had me at two of his teacher, his three-day teacher clinics, you know, for free because I was doing all this stuff for him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he he stopped by, you know, we, we kind of palled around some. We, we went to eat a couple times. You know, he was, uh, uh, I don't know if I answered your question. You had said something that triggered off another stream of thought, and of course, I forgot it went that one too. Well, I, I what I was curious about was uh, in the period of time that, that that you knew him, did you see his teachings, theories, concepts evolve during that time? Uh, I'm not sure. I would say evolved. I think he was better able to clarify things. Uh, he, he got all excited at this one point because uh, he had this, what he called the chop opus. And he said, you know, he had uh, uh, diagnosed the 157 students or something like, yeah, he was, he was kind of a, a promoter, you know what I mean? All right. So yeah, 150, it might've been 12 students, who knows? But, uh, and, you know, he found that the most uh, common problem uh, was careless, rapid mouth corner inhalations. That was the number one biggest problem and then the second biggest problem was careless standard mouth corner inhalations so he might have just been trying to drive a, a point home that you know if, if you're always disturbing your embouchure every time you breathe and you know you're taking a lot of fast breaths and you like take it off put it back on you know you're hitting yourself in the mouth after a while uh, you got to be able to keep that sucker in place and you know just take a little quick like a sniff breath or you know a little mouth corner breath uh so i think uh I don't know that I saw his teaching change. 
You know, he did say uh, uh, he would. He used to. Yeah. Okay. He wouldn't give people as much stuff early on. He would wait till they came uh, several times before he would give them more stuff. But then he started giving them like, like he gave me the ten test drills uh, with my orientation analysis papers, and uh, you know the pivot classification one, pivot classification two, uh, several things, and uh, and then he he would say D positively, do not go past this page. And there was all this stuff. Well, you know what? I didn't go past that page. And uh, a couple lessons later, he said, I, I know you've been playing all that stuff. And I said, no, you said, don't go past it. He said, you're the first. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, I think he decided uh, to just, you know, give more stuff. Uh, and the encyclopedia, he, he didn't even say, I need you to buy the encyclopedia. He kept talking about it. And I said, so where can I buy this encyclopedia? He says, well, I have some copies right here. So, uh, you know, I bought one from him, but, uh, yeah, he, he was a funny dude, man. It, he would crack himself up. He'd be laughing and I'd be sitting there. I wouldn't understand what he was laughing about, but, uh, yeah, he was a trip, man. Yeah. Have you heard any of the recordings? Mike cleaned up a bunch of those. Yeah. You know, I started to listen to some of them and then I got sidetracked and just, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. That, that's I, a commitment to listen to yeah. all those. Yeah. I went and because because uh i i love all my all my listeners my, all my audience there are going to be links to all that in the show notes so if, okay. if you would like to go and check those out uh there'll be links in the show notes for that so you can, now, you can get gotta give mike barkley credit he uh he he does audio engineering or something and uh he took uh i i sent him everything i had uh and he cleaned up the sound uh, there's there's this one that I have not posted yet, and it's uh, a Berkeley. Uh, he did a clinic at Berkeley College in uh, Boston, and uh, they were done on a cassette tape. And the only problem, you know, Mike cleaned it up. He gets rid of all the background noise and everything, but you can't hear the questions or the comments from the people. So I've been kind of struggling with, you know, is Mike going to, and they, he'll hear this now. Is he going to be upset if I post them that, that were not the uh, versions that he cleaned up? Because I need to be able to hear the guys ask. Plus, I listen to everything in my earbuds. Yeah. So, yeah. I, Mike, the, the gauntlet has been thrown, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't known how to approach him on this one. I, I know he knows that I haven't put him up yet. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure he he understands completely. Uh, but I so with – um. There, there are tons of there. There are a lot of resources, and there are obviously, uh, you know, a number of of very, very well uh, established teachers in uh, in in Doc's uh, system and and his approach to to teaching. Uh, you know, Doug Elliott, one of the people that you mentioned, uh, Chris LaBarbera, um, uh, you know, yourself, obviously. Uh, and there, there are like there's Facebook groups. Uh, there is is there still a, is there still a Trumpet Herald group? Uh, Trumpet Herald has uh, the Reinhardt Forum. Uh, <clears throat> there's uh, varying degrees of uh, the Reinhardt students who still post there. Uh, I, I understand Kenny Smuckle is still teaching a la Reinhardt. Scott Holbert in Pennsylvania. Uh, Rene Bernard. If, if he's still out there, last I knew he was in Connecticut or something, he ought to be teaching Reinhardt because he was a good Reinhardt student. Uh, you know, Roger Holmfield was a great Reinhardt student down in, I think he's in Hollywood, Florida. Uh, Bill Gibson, he's, uh, he's actually the guy that convinced me I need to go see Reinhardt. There was a guy, uh, Mark Weigel, I was in the army with, and, and he had gone to see Reinhardt before he came in the army. So Mark, you know, he sounded great, good jazz player. Uh, excellent jazz player and and he was able to put you know pop off these you know f's and g's and he said you know i couldn't always do that and i'm thinking yeah right he said i went and saw doc reinhardt and, and he helped me so i was the first person i ever heard of doc reinhardt so bill gibson i had gone to school with him you know like we were in little league together you know what i mean and uh you know bill <laughs> trombone player and you know i didn't take him seriously in high school and uh so i i heard him well, it had to be 78. Uh, so I graduated high school in 73. So it was some years later. And uh, I hear Bill and he just sounds ridiculously good. 
And I just said, Bill, I said, man, you sound so good. What happened? You're like a left-handed compliment. What happened? And he said, oh, I've been studying with Doc Reinhardt. And uh, Dave, David Prine was also there. And David Prine says, yeah, man, if you want to get some chops, you got to go see Doc Reinhardt. So that was it. That sealed the deal. So I, I, they gave me the phone number. One of them gave it to me. And uh, next thing you knew, I was going up to uh, have a lesson with Doc Reinhardt. Yeah. Changed my life. Well, uh, certainly if, you, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Doc, uh, his teachings, and you know, if you want to find out about your classifications and things, I'd certainly suggest you check out some of the, the names that have been mentioned and, uh, you know, do yourself a favor, you know, at least at this point, you know, if you, like I said before, if you're not getting the results you want, you know, it, what's the worst thing can happen, you know, but uh, so Rich, you, you, you know, you also have a, a lot of other stuff that you've got going on with your, you know, Bopism uh, music. Um, and I saw some, com some interesting uh, books that you've, you've done uh, your trumpet voodoo and your, <laughs> your, your take on the, on Clark too. <laughs> So it's it's kind of that innovative approach to uh, yeah taking taking things that we might take for granted and find boring and making more interesting. So uh, I, what what's what inspired your trumpet voodoo and your trombone voodoo uh, books? Okay, so first of all, it's baptism. There's a T in there. Oh, baptism. baptism. Yeah, it's like baptism but with an O. I mean, with a yeah, baptism but with them. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so Doug has having me practice this stuff, and uh, I've been practicing it. And, uh, and, and then I just felt like, uh, well, it's kind of like what I was saying that doc told me, you know, the, the, what do we say? There were nine basic elements of brass playing. And, uh, so I, with the exception of, uh, compression, it's all in, uh, these, uh, voodoo books, trumpet voodoo and, uh, trombone voodoo. Uh, but yeah, uh. There's Reinhardt principles embedded in these things, but you don't have to study with Reinhardt to get the, the benefit of them, which is, you know, I, I think that's a clever trick. Uh, in fact, uh, that was Chris's contention why we needed to get uh, Reinhardt's. He called it, the, it was called the Pivot System Manual of Studies. And Chris said, you know, Reinhardt didn't leave like a wealth of actual stuff for people to practice. So you need to, you need to make uh, this into a, a book and I said, well, you know, you got copyright issues. And he said, well, you know, that was put out in like 1942 or something. It, didn't, it, didn't the copyright expire? Well, I, I did enough research to find out that uh, if you change enough things and do a fresh engraving, uh, you know, like things that were in 4-4, uh, four, four, we put them in 6-4. And, you know, what, what was a half note is now a dotted half note. You know stuff like that so it, it actually plays the same it just looks different so uh so we put out the reinhardt routines and that the idea of that was so people could get the benefit of doing reinhardt's drills without actually having studied with him the only thing in that book that was troublesome to me was uh it starts with the uh, uh pivot stabilizer and if you don't get typed uh, it's possible that you can do the pivot stabilizer incorrectly for your particular physical type. So Reinhardt used to tell me, he said, if you don't drop the jaw, if you keep the weight on your lower lip and you don't drop the jaw, then you're going to pivot correctly. And he said the, the, the uh, descending pivot, I'm sorry, a descending slur, uh, how did he say it? Uh, the key to all around correct brass playing is the correct execution of a descending slur so a descending slur you keep the weight on your lower lip and he didn't say pressure you keep the weight on your lower lip and you don't drop your jaw so if, if you can <laughs> internalize and do that then the pivot stabilizer works for you and you don't need to know what type you are so i tried to make that clear in the directions keep the weight on the lower lip don't drop your jaw to descend so uh yeah, and so that set of drills, uh, it's it's ridiculous, man. You know what? I don't advertise, and we get orders all the time for the Reinhardt routines. And then uh, I was practicing. You know, when when I put a book together, I practice out of it for a while before I publish it, so I can find hopefully all the mistakes. Which you know, I still find mistakes later. But uh, and then uh, focal point, uh, I was teaching at Clemson, and I had all these students. They didn't come to me for Reinhardt. They came to me because. 
they were in marching band and they were required to take trumpet lessons. So I had, you know, 20 something students and uh, these guys were showing up and they wouldn't have practiced and uh, they didn't know how to practice. So I started just uh, giving them drills so that in the course of my lesson with them, uh, I basically taught them how to practice. And, uh, and that's focal point arose out of uh, practicing. <laughs> and, and I would do this stuff, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 times a day with them. And then I'd go play gigs and I'd feel like a million bucks. So it was good for me, that's for sure. But uh, I was playing a lot of lead then too. Yeah, I, I got a DVD recently of a, a gig I was playing lead on. I'm thinking, good grief, man. I didn't know I could play that good. <laughs> but uh, I should do that again. Anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of the, actually every single book with the exception of Trumpet Voodoo came about because I was writing it for students, uh, putting together a collection of things to help students without them knowing, you know, the underlying principles, you know, the Reinhardt stuff. And, uh, and then Trumpet Voodoo, I wrote for myself. If I wanted stuff to practice. I wanted to have a selection of scale stuff to practice, a selection of melodic material to practice, and then a selection of technical stuff to practice so that I keep all these things alive every day. And uh, yeah, I've been practicing out of it for a couple months, man. And I tell you what, uh, you know, for, for being uh, still a, a fledgling 3A, it's, it's not natural. Doug told me that the biggest tendency is to go back into my old playing groove and I'm fighting to not to go back into my old, you know, 3B playing groove. But, you know, the more I do these materials, it's like I, I have days where I feel like a million bucks, man. So I'm, I'm still waiting to feel like a million bucks on a gig. Uh, I, I've, I've gotten better. I played several gigs and it's, it's humiliating, you know, to be, you know, I'm 66 now and I go out there and I sound, you know, kind of amateurish. It's kind of humiliating. But uh, yeah, it's, it's starting to happen, man. So, you know, Mike, Mike Sailors, I was telling you about him earlier. He made the transition. He said within six months, man, he didn't have to think about it. Well, it's eight months for me, and I'm still uh, I'm still having to think about it. So, you know, maybe uh, being twice his age is taking me twice as long. Who knows? Yeah, well, yeah, it, uh, it's it's it, your your age is showing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I never. Bottom line is, I never set out to write a book. I never said oh, I'm going to sit down and write a book. Never happened, man. They all came about as doing something for situations. And then the next thing, you know, it's like, hmm. And then I do a couple more things and hmm. And then I'll add a few more things. It's like, all of a sudden, whoa, you know, I, this, this could, this could actually be turned into a book. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I did when I wrote my book. It was, it was just a, a lot of little stuff that I was doing and, and other things. And it's like, oh, is, it, is that what I see right there that I can't really see? Yes. It's my book, Mindfulness Secrets. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so that, that that's exactly how that all came about. It's like, you know, all these little things and concepts and it's like, oh, well, I could make this a book. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it's it, because they're coming from practical perspectives, you know, and, and sometimes I think that when that's an organic way of creating something uh, and you I think also you're you're utilizing it in the. Uh, this isn't theoretical. You know, the, this is stuff that that you've been uh, developing in in the practice room, uh, in the the classroom, uh, and and seeing the results that you get. So then you know it's already a tested and known commodity. So that that's a great way of approaching stuff. And then I have the advantage of having spent all those years as a typesetter. Uh, I know how to make things look nice. You know, I know how to make uh, publications look presentable. So for me to turn out a book is, is really not a big deal. Well, it takes a long time, but uh, it's, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> In fact, uh, the first book that I had, I, I took it to Charles Colin, actually Alan Colin, and it was a duet book. And uh, I walked in there and uh, it, it was all done. I, you know, there were page, uh, camera ready pages. It was, it was already done. And he said, you know, no, author composer has ever brought a finished product like this that he did himself so usually we get this messy manuscript and we got to engrave it and go edits and all this stuff and then they got to do all the page layouts and it's you know it's a long process he said i've never <laughs> i've never had anybody do this so that's that's kind of cool you know the typesetting kind of you know it, all the all the broken pieces of my life sort of fall together you know what i mean yeah, yeah well that that's uh 
there's something to be said for that, you know, and sure, man. And I, you know, and that's a great lesson for, for most people is that, you know, uh, I've done a lot of different things in my life. And uh, I, there was a point where I kind of felt like, when am I ever going to figure things out and just do one thing? But then it's, it, it was like, you know, when you, I, I forget how old I was, it was probably in my, in my late fifties where I, I kind of turned and looked back on my life and said, Oh, well, all of this stuff has just led me to the point I'm at right now. And all of right, those right. skills ha- are actually, you know, they're, they're all important. They're all integrated into my life. So yeah. when you can, and that's, that's a joy of old age. I think, you know, you're, you're a few years older than me, but uh, yeah, not that many. So you, know, you kind of reach a point where you can kind of see where everything did come into play. And, and, and that if you can embrace that, then you can start pulling from those lessons and you can apply them to your life. So. And, and I'm grateful that I was no child prodigy. I'm not even an adult prodigy. But uh, <laughs> uh, Rich Madison used to talk about uh, uh, child prodigies, how he didn't really trust, you know, this, you know, the latest 13 year old kid who's, you know, a badass, because he wants to wait till they're as old as everybody else struggling for all the same gigs, seeing if he, you know, if, if, if he makes it through uh, adolescence and, you know, youth and early adulthood, you know, if <laughs> And you know what? I, I understand that today when he was talking about that, I was, and I I've known a couple of child prodigies and, you know, a couple of them have uh, turned into, you know, fine adult, you know, really mature players, but a lot of them, you know, and, and doc used to talk about talent is the enemy. It ta- talent is not necessarily your friend. Talent can be your biggest enemy. So nothing beats hard work and persistence and dedication. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like uh, the, the, the very uh, beginning of our conversation about, you know, learning through those mistakes and having to, having to figure stuff out because, uh, you know, we, we all are going to run into a point where that becomes a necessary skill. And, uh, the faster you can learn that it's okay to fail. Uh, and that the only, the only failure that, that you true failure that you have is when you fail to learn a lesson from those mistakes. So, Very well put. Yeah, that's that, that, that's that's great, great stuff. All right, well, I tell you what, my friend, we've got a few. Um, I, I could certainly talk about uh, you know, Doc's teachings and your playing and and uh, all that sort of stuff forever and ever and ever. But we have a few stock segments that we have to get through. Okay. Uh, and um, the first one, I because if I don't do this, especially this first one, I'm going to catch so much crap because this is sponsored by our mutual friend, Michael Barkley. Oh, good. Of Barkley Microphones. Uh, yeah. This is called Sound Off. Uh, this is about your approach to sound. And uh, uh, let's kind of keep with this this theme the, uh, as uh, we, we really wanted to, to kind of do the deep dive into the uh, the teachings of, of Doc and, and then your uh, understandings of it and, and your adaptations of it. Um, what are, what are some of the, the principal concepts of sound that you, uh, that you have in terms of, uh, how to approach creating the, the kind of, uh, trumpet sound that, that, uh, is the best that you can get for your given situation? Huh? Uh, I guess if, if you listen to a lot of great players somewhere subconsciously or consciously, you're going to emulate great players. Uh, the first trumpet player I really listened to was Herb Alpert, and I'm sure I'm not uh, unique in that. Uh, you know, heard Al Heard on the radio. Uh, the first jazz trumpet player I heard that just really grabbed me was Clifford Brown. So, uh, you know, Doc used to say, uh, and he, he could talk forever about what is a fine sound on a brass instrument. Uh, he said, the microphone here is different than the human ear. <clears throat> so I'm sure... Uh, Mike Barkley has incorporated that into, uh, cause I, I know what, right. Arturo is using one of Mike's microphones now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I've got a Royer R20, R122. Uh, yeah, I should hit Mike, see what he says. It takes like six months to get one of his mics or is, is he producing it faster now? Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's kind of backed up, you know, Okay. I'm, I'm but, waiting for my new one because he's supposed to be, <laughs> is that one of his? Yeah. It's one of his right oh, here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sounds, sounds beautiful. It's supposed to be putting the special Arturo filter in it <laughs> to get all the wrong notes out. Yeah, to exactly. Increase the velocity, right? Exactly. But, uh, but yeah, Reinhardt said, you know, for microphone use, uh, you want to don't point directly at a mic, point kind of off to the side just a little bit, 
he said the microphone hears the crispness the, the brilliance the brightness in the sound better than it hears the resonance uh if you play acoustically in a big hall yeah it's great to have a resonant sound uh if you're anywhere that a microphone is present he used to say you need to have some some brilliance some edge on your sound or else the microphone's gonna you know think of this uh tubby i think that was the word he used a tubby sound so I've always gone for a bright sound, and uh, even as a 3B, I always had a really bright sound. Even playing, you know, playing a 3C Bach mouthpiece for years, I still had a bright sound. So I'm also convinced today that no matter what equipment you play, you can have an old ambassador with a 7C mouthpiece. You play that for 20 years, you're going to sound the way you're going to sound on anything. You know, you... Um, you know, Clark's gone, but you hand Clark Terry any horn, he's going to sound like Clark Terry. You know what I mean? So I think uh, a lot of people get caught up in the minutia of equipment, and I think it's a waste of time and a waste of money. I think dedication in the practice room and uh, focus and concentration on the bandstand and hearing a lot of recordings of yourself, I think that's so important to developing a sound. I think I might have answered this question. I think I might be the first one I answered, or did I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. No, I, it's absolutely, I absolutely love that. Uh, and actually, I, I, I would do want to kind of side, kind of go down a, a slight little uh, rabbit hole on this. Um, there are, uh, it, it, as I remember, uh, Doc did mention that there are some some typical sound quality issues. Uh, that are related to to some of the types, um, like uh, as my in yeah, you know, like my playing it. I've always had that kind of a, a bright, brilliant kind of sound, uh, and it, it always kind of lent itself to that. Uh, so what what did, am I remembering correctly? You are, that, you are. And and what what are those, <clears throat> those more typical? Uh, results based on on uh, knowing that players can shade them uh but you know what what are the the typical characteristics of those types okay so generally speaking a uh a 3b will have a, a bigger wider enormous quantity of sound is the way doc used to t say it if you're standing next to a 3b in a trumpet section you you hear him man you hear that guy because it's a big sound maynard good grief man maynard's sound filled it was crazy man you know i used to warm up in the like the next room from him or he would come backstage and, and he'd be playing while the band's playing the first tune and he had the most enormous sound it was just gigantic okay uh and as far as projection uh a 3b does project a 3a if you're standing next to him in the section you think this guy is kind of a wuss man you're like you, you don't hear him off to the side that's because his sound is projecting out front, man. You can hear a three A just magnificent. There's you you don't struggle to hear him, and then uh, a four uh, tends to have uh, a more uh, what's the word that he used to use like a strident, a bright sound. Uh, you don't see a lot of uh, type fours in orchestras. That they do exist. It's because they're playing like the the most jumbo silky twenty four or like. Bach one uh, <laughs> drilled out to like a you know, whatever the biggest bore you can have is uh, because they have to kind of hide. But yeah, a, uh, a type four can have a shrill sound if they're not careful, but it's also, you know, it, it's great for cutting through in the high register. Uh, fours, uh, and I, I remember Doc talking about this, and Chris LaBarbera has reiterated this many times. Fours can have more problems with tonguing than uh the other types you know three a's can three a's seem it seems to be like the best type uh if, if you're lucky enough to be a three a i think you you suffer the least uh difficulties and uh yeah i was going somewhere with that and once again i derailed myself that's but like, that's good because you probably have another question well, well no but i mean because like when it that's what, what i loved about the the stuff with doc uh was like when i thought about all the problems that i had and i started reading you know a, as a four it's like oh yeah okay <laughs> yep that's me that's me oh, that's oh me. by the way i know the other thing i was going to say earlier uh lewis dowdswell is that how you say his name lewis dowdswell mm -hmm. uh 
there was a thing he said i studied with chris labarba like a month ago or something and this guy good grief man he i i had never heard a more succinct uh encapsulation of so much of reinhardt's teaching as that guy it's like he had either absorbed it quick or he'd been reading the encyclopedia encyclopedia for years he only said one thing that i found uh contrary to what doc had told me which was he said type fours should never buzz and what doc told me was type fours ought to buzz their lips they should just not buzz and walk into the mouthpiece because when a type four buzzes the airstream still goes down but when he puts the mouthpiece up to his face while he's buzzing it has to switch directions and that'll just cause distortion so and when doc talked about buzzing he was talking about buzzing your lips not pinning it down with the mouthpiece he's talking about buzzing your lips so all these guys who say free buzzing no, I don't say free buzzing. I, I, that annoys me, man. Like buzzing, you know, that's buzzing. You know, this other free uh, or, or mouthpiece buzzing. Yeah, you know, I know Clark Terry did that and Clark Terry was great and everything. But uh, Reinhardt told me, he said, you, you get so much more benefit from just buzzing your lips. As soon as you put the, uh, the metal against your lips and pin your lips against your teeth, he says, you can get away with all kinds of stuff. Uh, your your muscles have to do everything when it's just your lips. So, yeah, there, there was that was my soapbox for this hour. Okay, all right, there you go. Oh. <laughs> all right, let's move on to our uh, free passing, free passing, free passing. Oh, shut up, man, free bird. Our next segment is uh, called Geared Up. It's brought to us by Venture Mouthpieces, Venture where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. Use the code Trumpet Gurus twenty one, get ten percent off your order. And this is about gear. Obviously, you know if you're a trumpet player, you got to talk about gear. Uh, but you know, it, it's not so much like you know, hey man, you know. You show me your mouthpiece, I'll show you mine. Sort of talk about gear, but you know more about the concepts about uh, the relationship between gear and the player, and you know keeping in with with this theme of of, uh, of Reinhardt's teachings. Um, you know, are are there specific kinds of of gear that uh, that tend to work best based on type, or uh, do you have suggestions for for that, or is it just the the free for all? All right, so. Uh... No matter what kind of mouthpiece somebody walks, if you walked into me with a Venture mouthpiece, is that what it is, Venture? That's correct. Yeah, if you walked in and you showed me your mouthpiece, I would pick it up and look at it and I would say, that's an excellent mouthpiece. Because you know what? Every mouthpiece is excellent. It just, does it suit your purposes? Uh, you know, if, if you're going <laughs> to, if you're going to try to play uh, uh, fourth trumpet in a big band, uh, do you need like the tiniest, shallowest mouthpiece? Well, some guys can do it, but it may not be the one that makes your job the easiest. Uh, if, if you play a mouthpiece, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I really don't have anything to say about mouthpieces. Uh, you know, every, every mouthpiece is good. You know, it has its advantages. It, it, I think every single mouthpiece has a certain set of advantages and a certain set of disadvantages. And if you can find the one that's like the happiest medium for what you want to do, then it's an excellent mouthpiece. I think they're all excellent. The mouthpiece doesn't do a damn thing, man. It's us that does it. You know, we put our lips up to it and then we play it. The mouth, if, you know, I don't have one right. Yeah, here we go. Here's my bass trumpet mouthpiece. Look at that mouthpiece. How does that sound? How's the high register on this mouthpiece? Mouthpiece doesn't do anything, man. You know, it's, it's, it's the embouchure. It's your your physical makeup you know the player learns how to play a mouthpiece yeah. so the adventure mouthpieces i'm sure those are outstanding mouthpieces i love them every single one of them man i think they're all fantastic <laughs> oh, great. well i guess it may, it, so maybe here's here's maybe here's a, a a better question to ask you yeah yeah uh, you that, gotta be a better one that that's that's more specific as uh, particularly to your experiences uh as as someone who doubles triples uh you know home runs whatever uh if someone who, who's who's switching between gear uh a lot um you know what what are you what are you looking at in terms of uh being able to to have a consistent feel between instruments uh and you know how how does that affect your your playing you know overall like yeah you talked about how playing tuba kind of adjust it you know made your your uh your track change a little bit 
Uh, I mean, how, how do you deal with having to work with different, different equipment? And, and is there ways to make it easier to, to do that? Yeah, it kind of comes back to the more time I spend on each of them, the more instantly my face recognizes which mouthpiece I've put up to my face. So if, if I, I mean, I, I practice all three instruments every day, the trombone mouthpiece, the tuba mouthpiece, the trumpet mouthpiece. I don't practice flugelhorn. Uh, I only play it on gigs. I know that's a sacrilege for some people to hear. And you know what? I'll go on another soapbox thing. Uh, I've seen so many guys in big bands and, and, and a solo comes up on their part and they immediately dive for their flugelhorn. It's like, don't do that. Play a trumpet solo, man. Unless it says flugelhorn, play a trumpet solo. You know, Clifford Brown never played a damn flugelhorn. You know what I mean? I mean to me, that's like the greatest trumpet sound uh, in jazz ever. Well, almost the great, well, po possibly. Well, let's say, just say one of the top 10, right? Yeah. Maybe my top one, but one of the top 10 greatest trumpet sounds. You know, uh, trumpet is a great sound. So, you know, why the people think, oh, well, it's jazz and I get around better on my flugel. No, man, pick, pick up your trumpet and be heard. You know, flugelhorn gets buried in a big band too, unless you got the microphone right there. You know, Cl now Clark Terry, uh, he's a, an exception to pretty much all the rules. When Clark played flugelhorn, you know, it's like when uh, <laughs> when Charles Schwab talks, people listen or whatever. You know, when Clark Terry plays whatever he played, man, it was phenomenal. But for most guys, I, I consider flugelhorn to be the great equalizer. It, it can make a good player sound average, and it can make an average player sound better than, you know, well, well. A below average player sound average. Let's put it that way. But yeah. Uh, okay. So Doc used to say a type four, they'll often play a bigger mouthpiece so they don't have such a bright uh, penetrating sound. Uh, he also said, play the smallest mouthpiece you can get away with. Uh, I, uh, on trumpet, uh, I have, I've changed since I came back to trumpet in uh, 90, what year was it? 96, I came back to trumpet. Uh, I think I've only played three mouthpieces. I was playing, a, my teacher told me to play a Bach 1C or something at uh, uh, University of South Florida. And then I went to Manhattan School of Music and uh, Lou Soloff told me I needed to play something smaller. And uh, a buddy of mine said, get a... Uh, Bob Reeves 43C3, which I did. And I played that for years. And then uh, I was playing West Side Story. I played it for three weeks, eight shows a week, playing the first part. And the last day, a buddy of mine, Bill Dunn, who's a great trumpet player in the D.C. area, uh, he came through town and he sat in the pit with me. And, uh, and, and by the end of that show, that 43C3 mouthpiece felt enormous. Well, Bill was a big three, the Bach 3C guy. So he had like, I don't know, 25 or 30 of them in his case, right? So uh, we went back to my house and I'm playing all these Bach 3Cs and it felt really good. Uh, Mark Curry uh, sent me his equivalent of the Bach 3C and I've been playing that since probably 2007. So I'm not into mouthpiece changes. I, I firmly believe that you find a mouthpiece that makes sense, the smallest one you can get away with, and you just stay on it and play it. You're going to sound the way you sound. You're going to, you know, I've, I've, I've played plenty of high G's on uh, uh, a three C and I've never been a double C player because I'm not the best Reinhardt student. I think I've told you that a few times now. Uh, <laughs> and I have all the materials here. You know, you're trying to work on being a jazz musician. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, trying to, keep it's like the guy in the, the circus who spins the plates you know what i mean trying to keep all these plates spinning or you know juggling all these things in the air uh man developing range is for me and uh you know uh the 3b doc used to call that the blood and guts type because anything you you attain on as a 3b you really had to work your ass off for to get to so to develop range as a 3b i really i worked really hard to do that so, uh, so now as a 3A, uh, well, I'll let you know, man. It's only been eight months. All right. Well, well, we'll, we'll have a check-in with you uh, at, at month 12. How's that? Okay. Well, we'll see, we'll see how you are. You, yeah. It should be interesting. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to have a breakthrough any day and have my double Cs like Mike Sailors.
Ah, well, yeah. save a few and send them to me. <laughs> yeah, one final segment to get through, and uh, this is uh, brought to us by our friends at Robinson's Remedies. Robinson's Remedy Rapid Relief for your sore and tired chops. This is called the Robinson's Remedy Rapid Fire Round. It's a series of questions that uh, have absolutely no connection to anything. They just kind of bounce around, uh, you know, kind of like your, kind of like your chops at the end of a, a six hour big band hit. And uh, so. If you're ready, Rich, we're going to get going. Give me your quickest answer to the following questions. I just got to say something about Robinson, man. Mr. Robinson, he, he uh, was the guy who who had the uh, jazz chair after I got off of Maynard. I think Yeah, he, he might have been the, the – yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've gotten to know him. I love the guy, man. He's a good guy. Go ahead. Ken, Kenny's a good dude. He's a good dude. He is, man. He's a great dude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so here we go. First question for you, Rich. Who's the biggest influence in your life that is not a trumpet player? Frank Zappa. Uh, or, or Charlie Parker. Okay. All right. <clears throat> all right, what's your favorite book? <laughs> Other than Trumpet I, Vision. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. Uh, I better not say that. We'll have to talk about this later, okay? I'll we'll talk about that one later. Okay. What's the worst movie you've ever seen? The worst movie I've ever seen? <clears throat> it's so funny because my wife and I will watch a movie, and five minutes before the end, we'll look at each other and say, wait, I think we've seen this before. So we get to enjoy a movie again for the first time. Uh, the worst movie I've ever seen? <laughs> i don't know man <laughs> uh, next question <laughs> yeah, i'm stumping you i'm stumping you okay uh if you were a trumpet player uh or brass player what would you want to be if i was not a trumpet player or a brass player <clears throat> well when i got out of high school i wanted to be a recording engineer so but i also wanted to live on a mountain and write music so I'd, I'd want to be a composer or a recording engineer or both. All right. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Aquafina. All right. Uh, you're going to have a dinner party. And at this dinner party, uh, you can invite any three people in the world. Any three living people could come uh, to be at this party. Who would you want to have there? My wife. Do I include my wife? Hey, that's a given. <laughs> that's a given. Okay, so four people. Friend, friends and family. <clears throat> so they're, my they're wife and I are inviting three people over. Yeah. Uh, man, you're you're stumping me all over the place. Three people who are alive. I mean, if if they were people who were no longer with us, but they would still be able to make it over to dinner. Uh, we'll we'll get to that in a second. We gotta get. Oh, okay. We got to get the people the, who are alive. You know, I'm, I'm not really much of a hero worshiper, so I can't really, you know, I mean, well, I guess Jesus Christ is still alive. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to skip that one, too. All right. Well, let's go. Let's go to the second part of the question, which is any three people from history. Any three people that are no history. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, definitely Jesus. Uh, well, Charlie Parker, <laughs> we wouldn't have anything to drink for him. We wouldn't have any drugs for him, but, uh, maybe he could stay sober and have dinner with us. There you go. Uh, three people and, uh, Mark Twain. Okay. Samuel Clemens. That sounds good. All right. Lacquer plated or raw. Oh. Uh, I can't play raw because it makes my hands turn green. All right. I've had plenty. Uh, what's your favorite quote? My favorite quote is actually a <clears throat> Mark Twain quote, which I recently saw attributed to Denzel Washington, but it was actually Mark Twain who said, uh, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you're misinformed. All right. Uh, what is your greatest fear? My greatest fear? 
what's my greatest fear? <laughs> I joke I joke about uh having uh road band PTSD because I have these dreams about uh it's like a variation of things. I'm gonna miss the bus that I'm, I'm I, I left the uh the gig to go find something to eat and then I'm trying to get back to the gig and I can't find the gig or I'm I'm trying to get back to the stage and I hear the band has already started. So I think those must be some like deep seated uh fears generated from spending, you know, a lot of time on the on road bands. So I don't know, as far as biggest fear of uh like today. Uh I don't know, man. I'm I'm not going to say that I'm without fear. I just can't think of any uh, anything that's like serious enough to to traumatize me right now. All right, all right. Next question: uh, You could be granted one superpower. What would it be? <laughs> uh, if I could be granted one. Man, where do you get these questions? If I could grant, uh, well, so I guess I hark back to uh, Superman, right? In my youth, George Reeve. Yeah. Oh, superpower. Uh, well, you know, it would be nice. Like I've had two shoulder surgeries now, and my shoulder still is still isn't right. I just like to be able to hold the trumpet for hours at a time and never get tired. How's that? I right. and super shoulder endurance. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That super shoulder man. That would be your name. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you find to be the most overrated? Uh, well, let's face it. We all, it's exciting when we hear a guy who has range, use it well. Uh, but range as a means to its, it, an end can be one of the most annoying things. You know what? The first time I heard Maynard, no, it wasn't the first time. Uh, it might've been the third time I heard him. I was in Denton, Texas and I heard the band and I left there thinking, I don't ever want to hear another high note. You know, because at the time I was into Kenny Dorham and, you know, Clifford Brown and Tom Harrell and, you know, like tasteful jazz musicians. And it was like, I don't ever want to hear another high note. So, yeah, maybe just the uh, sheer range for the sake of, you know, range. If, if you're really like Carl Saunders, you ever listen to Carl Saunders? Oh, yeah. Man, when that guy plays and he goes up there, it's meaningful. But a lot of guys, it's just kind of like obligatory, like. <laughs> who is the guy at itg uh you know him uh he's in the minozel why can i he plays that trumpet that looks like he squeezed it too hard tom ganch tom there Scott. you go yeah so he was doing a thing and 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 he, he he pops off a double c and he goes like you know checked off that one it's it's like you know obligatory you know and and, it, and when he did it, it it wasn't annoying but you know some guys they do it it's like they think they have to and it's you know i don't think so man you don't have to do that and uh, Roger Ingram, man, he he can do it all night, right? And I heard him get up and, and do a feature. And he didn't, I don't think he went above a high C and it was brilliant, you know? So yeah, I, I think just sheer upper register for the sake of, uh, what's the word I want to use? <laughs> Two the there, there's a word that I'm actually avoiding using. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So, uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you think is the most underrated? The most underrated, I think, is uh, what aspect of trumpet is the most under? Well, trumpet has always been known as like the strongest melody instrument, I think. You know, if you want the melody heard, you give it to a trumpet. So, uh, Maybe as is in a supportive role rather than in a lead role. Maybe that's uh, the mo most underappreciated is the uh, you know trumpet. Like I know I, I wrote a thing where I have the trombones above the trumpet, and it's cool, man. And I think the trombones sound really good because the trumpets are written under the trombone. So I, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Cool. All right, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Find a different way to make a living. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, hey. I, I, if, if you've got the bug, man, there's nothing else you can do. Because I like all those years I was doing typesetting, I was not happy doing that. Although today I'm really grateful that I did that. Yeah. But you know, if 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 you've got it, man, and you don't pursue it, you're going to regret it. So I guess that would be the answer. Okay, great. Uh, while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. Mm. Okay. Final question for you, Rich. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, well, I'll be gone. So probably won't be up to me. So you know what? It's okay. Whatever anybody wants to say or write is fine. <laughs> All right. That's certainly one way to think about it. <laughs> well, I mean, who has, if, if you think about, if you, if you spend your life trying to figure out what your legacy is going to be, come on, man, there's more important things to do. You know, it's it's not even in my lifetime anyway. So why, why, why you know, why bother, man? Come on, think uh, about it. Good enough. Yeah. All right. Well, Rich, I certainly appreciate you taking time uh, to hang with me today and uh, sharing your insights. And uh, I know you've got some great stuff going on with uh, you know all of your, your writing and uh, all your other projects. So, uh, folks, if you want to know more about Rich. Uh, and uh, purchase some of his uh, great books. You can find the notes. Uh, you can find the links in the show notes. So please reach out to him and, and uh, pick up your your swag from him. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to know more about the, uh, the teachings of uh, Doc Reinhardt, uh, certainly can uh, can find uh, the, all the resources that we have uh, listed as well. And you know, dive into that deeper. And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy the teachings, and uh, I think that uh, for anybody, any serious student, student of the trumpet, just uh, even if you if you're not going to follow the advice, at least just educate yourself on on what uh, the teachings are all about. I think that's that's the key thing right there. So, Rich, thank you, my friend, and I thank you for joining us for this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang. Make sure you like and subscribe, share this with a friend. And, uh, you know, if you have suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to let me know. And as always, folks, peace and slide grease. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of olive oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm -hmm.